year's 2016 Sigmund Rhee 1910 lecturer. Um, Mr. Reber was elected to the presidency in 2002 and re-elected in 2006. He was the first president to be consecutively re-elected in Colombia over, in over a century. Um, in the fall 2010, at the end of his presidency, he went to Georgetown University where he taught. And then in 2012, he and a group of political allies founded the Centro Democratico Party to contest the 214 national elections. He was elected as a sen senator at that point in the 2014 parliamentary, parliamentary election, which took office in July of 2014. Um, so the way we're going to do today is uh, Mr. Uribe will talk and give his presentation, and then we will open it up for Q&A. Um, as we always ask in these talks, um, we hope that students come to the microphones. And we also ask that this be a cordial, a robust, but cordial exchange of ideas. Um, and we know that we can deliver on that at Princeton. So thank you. Thank you, Dean Elizabeth, dear community, students, professors, visitors. It is a great honor for me to participate this evening in this prestigious university. Thank you for this invitation. My career, political career has been one of convictions, of doctrine. I have tried to be consistent in the relationship between my behavior and my way of thinking. And it has uh, sparked friendships, friends, and opposition, approval and criticism. Uh, I am open to, your, to all your questions over all uh, the topics you want to bring. And I want to be the shortest I can in these introductory remarks. I want to, to, to open all the rest of the time for your questions and to try to do my best in answering. Colombia has had a contradiction of solid democratic institutions and huge violence. In the 19th century, with the exception of seven years, Colombia was a country of civil wars. The last one came to an end in the year 1902. The country was left in ruins. One year later, Panama declare its independence. The country lived some years of peace. But at the very beginning of the 40s, we, have a, we had a new violence between the two main political parties. And in the last years of the 50s, Latin America had two very important political agreements. Punto Fijo in Venezuela. It was an agreement with the participation of all democratic forces to implement the rule of law in Venezuela. And at the same time, the National Front in Colombia, an agreement between the two main political parties to come to terms to put an end to this violence. Uh, we began a new life. The remnants of partisan guerrillas converted into Marxist-oriented guerrillas. Once Castro won, he chose two countries to replicate his revolution in Latin America, Bolivia and Colombia. I have known directly all this process. 
And we saw the appearance of Marxist-oriented guerrillas. I was a, a member of the minority in the students' movement. Because the majority of students in the state universities, they wanted to adopt the communist model of Cuba. The discussion, discussion was, which was the right model? The Cuban war, the Sovietic, Soviet model, the Chinese of Mao Zedong. The only vision they had was the vision of creating a communist model, the abolition of the rule of law, to be replaced for the proletariat dictatorship, the abolition of private ownership, the abolition of demo pluralistic democracy to replace it by social class struggles. I was against. There is one very important difference between Colombia and other countries. Because in the international communities and even in my country, I quite often hear that Colombia is a case similar to the case of El Salvador, of other Central American countries, similar to the case of Argentine, of Videla, Galtieri, or Pinochet in Chile. Mexican people have said that Mexico had the largest democracy in Latin America. Mexico had 12 years of democratic interruption in the last century, Colombia only four. What is the case of Colombia? Colombia is not the case of people uprising against dictators. Colombia has suffered a long challenge. First, a challenge of communist guerrillas against the rule of law. And after, the challenge of narco-terrorism. At the very beginning, our guerrillas were guerrillas with doctrine. Step by step, they evolved, and they became, became with the predominance of narco-trafficking mercenaries. Of course, they have political doctrine. I don't know any terrorist group in the world without political excuses. The lack of security, the lack of authority in my country left many people without protection. And the mix of guerrillas and the lack of protection for our people created the paramilitary organizations. At the end, guerrillas and paramilitaries as well became co-opted by narco-trafficking. This is what um, I found in the year 2002 when I was elected president for the first term. We introduced three policies. Security with democratic values, investment, the promotion of private investment and social cohesion. During my two terms, no leader of the opposition was killed. Many members of the radical opposition were elected. Mayors in Bogota, governors in some departments of the country. Former guerrilla, Mr. Navarro, a former member of the M19, was elected governor in Nariño department. And uh, my government treated them with the same respect that we treated those governors and mayors representing 
our political ideas. Our democratic security polit polit policy was totally respectful of the media. I discussed with the media. I argue, argue against journalists, but they never suffer restrictions. The more we advance in security, the more they enjoy freedoms. I have said that they were in the jail of permanent threats from terrorist groups. They were coaxed by terrorist groups. With democratic security, they began to act much more freely. Of course, there came accusations of human rights violations. And I won't refer to this point waiting for you to bring your comments, your questions, your remarks on these cases. The record of uh, security was very important. We reduced homicides from 28,000 per year to over 14,000. It was still very high, but the trend was very positive. Kidnapping. There was a reduction, reduction from over 3,000 per year. In the last year, we had 200. That the, uh, these cases did not take place in the main cities. We place a special interest in protecting teachers, trade union leaders. And uh, uh, journalists, before my administration, there were years when over 300 trade union leaders were killed. In the last year, 14, I wanted zero cases. We did our best. When I began in government, there was only one sentence convicting one murderer of trade union leaders. At the end of my administration, we had more than 200 sentences. Well, I could give you some similar numbers in regarding the protection of journalists and teachers. But uh, security was not alone. My department, Antioquia, endorsed me a lot and was determined for me to win the 2002 presidential elections because I had acted there as governor. And they endorsed me with this enormous amount of votes, not only for my stand on security, but because of our devotion to have a permanent dialogue with people and because we work with, to improve social issues in the department. Security was not, was not enough for my re-election as president. 63% of voters elected me re-elected me in the first round of the presidential election of the year 2006 because of the combination of security, investment promotion, and social policies. We reduced poverty from 50 to 37. For first time, the Gini Index began to improve in our country. Our aim was to bring down poverty bring poverty down to 30, we couldn't. Because of the international financial cri crisis, crisis. 
and we had other two crises. The close of the market in Venezuela because of President Chavez's decision and our fight against narco-trafficking financial pyramids in my country. Investment, foreign direct investment passed from two billion American dollars. And in the year 2012, my country had 15 billion plus Colombian corporation investment in overseas. For the first time, Colombia began to have a huge number of big multinational corporations. And domestic investment passed from 20 billion to 70 billion in that same period of time. What are the main reasons that I argue for my disagreement with the current peace talks? First, security has deteriorated in Colombia. Narco trafficking is increasing again. And when the current government is asked, its answer is that once they sign the final agreement with FARC, in association with FARC, they will begin eliminating narco trafficking again. We cannot accept that FARC be chosen as the government and as asso associate to eliminate narco trafficking. FAR is the largest cartel over the, in cocaine over the world. I signed almost 1,200 orders of extradition, more than 1,100 for the United States. Today, the current government has accepted FARC to consider narco trafficking as a political crime. We cannot accept this. As a political crime, FARC won't have extradition, won't be that its members won't be extradited. Nor will they be punished in the country. Besides that, they will have the right for political eligibility. We never did it with a private investment. Social cohesion, it uh, has become unsustainable in the country. Independent institutions, now the only institution with independence in Venezuela is the National Assembly because of the last election. But the judiciary and the electoral body continue co-opted by the government and plural participation, pluralistic people participation. You know the restrictions to the media in Venezuela. Many independent journalists have to go out of the country. Progressive democracies are democracies fighting for security, promoting investment, advancing in social cohesion. With all the respect for independent institutions, however, there it is uh, understandable that the leaders of the institutions could have agreements and disagreements and pluralistic people participation. Hi, uh, President Uribe, thanks for your talk. So I know one thing the administration of President Santos has been pushing a lot is Colombia's membership accession into the OECD. So is this something you support as a way of Colombia being recognized as a rising economy and more stable country now? Or do you think it's something that's maybe a little, a little too rushed, shall we say? OECD -E 
Colombia at the end of administration was on the path to get investment right. And at the beginning of President Santos' administration, Colombia was given investment right. Colombia still has investment right, but the forecast for the economy in accordance with standards and pools is negative. This is the news we had this week. Today, the MD Emerging Markets Index Bonds in Colombia is around 400 points. At the end of administration, it was very low. We inherited to President Santos an MD of 170 points. Colombia has squandered the oil lottery. Today we have again a very high indebtedness. We reduce uh, public indebtedness from 48 to 35. Today it has reached 48 again. In incentives to the private sector have been dropped by the current administration. And Colombia has the fourth largest, highest tax burden all over the world. We have a problem of inflation, a problem of fiscal deficit, a problem of indebtedness, a problem of this very high burden of taxes, and at the same time, social discomfort because of the low salaries. Therefore, for me, at this moment, it does not matter whether or not Colombia will become a member of this international organization. <coughs> for us, what is the most important task in the coming years is to fix the economy and, of course, to guarantee the country security. For we are very fearful because of the agreements with FARC. They have put, uh, these agreements have put our militaries at the same level of terrorist groups. And we cannot consider our military forces the same than FARC. Our military forces have never been uh, dictatorial military forces. They have been institutional and professionals. Crimes have been isolated. It uh, never has been a uh, uh, an aim of criminality, a uh, proposal of criminality within our military forces. And we find them demotivated, discouraged, because uh, of the decisions made by this government to put them at the same level of guerrillas, for instance. With, uh, for political crimes, guerrillas won't go to jail. But in political crimes, the agreements have included narco-trafficking, the murder of soldiers and police, men, the kidnapping of them under the circumstances of armed confrontations. We cannot agree with that. But uh, it is innocuous because in the case of atrocious crimes, for FARC, it, it will be enough to recognize the crime. They will be sentenced but not punished. Because specifically speaking, the agreement say that they won't go to jail. Therefore, 
all this could create deeper problem insecurities in the years to come and much many more difficulties to the economy. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, hello. Um, yo hablo muy despacio en España. But um, uh, Princeton TV, could you compare and contrast uh, the Bush administration and the Obama administration's policies in Colombia? And if you want to add also your own personal relationship with the two presidents. Plan Colombia was conceived by my predecessor, President Pastrana, and President Clinton with the leadership of former ambassador to the United States, Luis Alberto Moreno, and the participation of the bipartisan coalition here in this country. I was opposed to President Pastrana because of the demilitarized zone. However, I supported Plan Colombia from the beginning. I visited Venezuela and Ecuador supporting Plan Colombia because the signing of Plan Colombia did spark a lot of protest in, these, in those countries. Gringos go home. And I supported those policies. My government did not coincide with President Clinton government, but he was very supportive. During the last 19 months of my administration, I coincided with President Obama. He was very supportive. Moreover, we signed with him a new agreement to stem Plan Colombia. And the current president of Colombia, when he was minister, he participated in the negotiation of this agreement. However, as president, my government was the first to confront the paramilitary organization. We dismantled the paramilitary. Roughly speaking, 4,000 were taken to jail. What is the reason to not take to jail, to not take far to jail? What are the differences in massacres? I extradited, extradited 14 kingpins of the paramilitary organization to the United States. They are in jail here. We gave them, as we gave 18,000 guerrillas who demobilized during our administration, shorter sentences, but never full impunity, never political eligibility. I consider that besides the risk before the international jurisdiction, for the lack of adequate punishment. This impunity is a very bad example. Impunity has been the midwife of new violences in Colombia. Now the second largest guerrilla, ELN, is expanding. It has recruited many people from far. And many people from far have uh, made a decision to commit crimes with the ELN uniform. There are new criminal organizations. They are known with the name of new criminal guns. Many of my critics said that these new criminal guns are because of the mistakes committed by my government when we, when we demobilize 35,000 members of the paramilitary organization. I disagree. If you consolidate 35,000 people demobilized from the paramilitary organization plus 18,000 from guerrillas, you have 53,000, 7% relapse. At the end of our administration, the new criminal guns had 
2,400 people. Today, only one criminal gun is larger than FARC, or as large as FARC. And I left government almost six years ago. Impunity set a very ba a badly example. It, uh, it uh, abets the surge or the expansion of criminal groups. I disagree what, with what could happen with the private sector in Colombia because of this peace agreement. And I, um, I am an advocate of the private sector, not because of the private sector, but because I believe in the necessity to take the expansion of the economy with the elimination of poverty and the creation of a much more fair income distribution, hand in hand. Venezuela has failed because they implemented social policies that became unsustainable for the reason that they expropriated the private sector and oil was not enough. On the other extreme, there were countries in Latin America in the 60s of the last century, such as the case of Brazil, with a robust economic growth, but without social policies. It was unsustainable. We believe in our party in the necessity to take hands in hands investment promotion with social policies. But I want to leave all the possible room for your question, questions, comments, and remarks. And I will beg you, Dean Elizabeth, to coordinate this part of the session. I, I beg only two things. Please speak slowly and the loudest you could. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sammy. I'm originally from Venezuela, so I was really interesting, interested in your talk about Venezuela. Being a president of more center-right-oriented policies, how is your relationship with other countries in the region that were taking a more leftist approach? and especially Hugo Chavez. That's my question. We were a dissident regarding that group of countries. My main difference, or the main cause for us to take distance and to discuss with President Chavez, it was because he support to our terrorist groups. Therefore, I never accepted that Venezuela were a paradise for Colombian terrorist groups. I have done this analysis. Now that we know the outcomes in Brazil, Lula inheritance was not good. The election of President Macri in Argentina gave us a clear indication that Kirchner inheritance, heritage, was not good. Chavez died without realizing the consequences of his wrong government. I did not leave Colombia converted into a paradise. We had mistakes and we lack many achievements. However, the country was, I consider in the right way, making significant progress in three aspects. 
security investment, and social cohesion. And uh, our heritage was good. Look at what has happened in Colombia with the economy in the last six years. Therefore, I have deep disagreements with these governments in the region because my government was a decent, dissident. We never approve their politics. Thank you so much. But let me add this. <laughs> I have divided Latin America, not between rightist and leftist governments. We have to consider what are progressive and what are regressive democracies. And I have introduced five elements for this analysis. Security. You know what has happened in Venezuela. It was a country of 4,000 cases of homicides per year. Now it's a country of over 24,000. Second, investment. Venezuela has put this agreement into effect. And he has eliminated a spray. He has eliminated, almost eliminated, manual eradication. President Bush, I am very grateful to him. He made very important decisions for my country. For instance, he accepted to help us with logistics for us to trace and to go after illegal flights. And his government accepted to sell my government smart weapons. These decisions were some case of tipping point for Colombia to begin dismantling the terrorist groups. President Obama speaks on the new phase of Plan Colombia. We agree, but we disagree with impunity, with political eligibility for those involved in atrocious crimes. We disagree with the idea, the agreement, the acceptance of the current Colombian government that narco trafficking is a political crime. We disagree with the acceptance of the current government to recognize FARC as a valid interlocutor to devise, to figure out how to handle the rural policies in Colombia. And we disagree with the idea to have FARC as the valid associate to abolish narco trafficking in Colombia. I don't know what will the United States say because of this concern, impunity. The United States has supported Colombia with more than $10 billion. And we have made a great effort. But today, not because of the United States, but because of the current Colombian government, it seems that we have lost this money and this help because of the new increase in narco trafficking and in violence. <coughs> During my administration, we passed from producing 700 metric tons of cocaine per year to less than 200. In the year two, 2014, in accordance with the United Nations and with the United States, Colombia produced 400. And people are expecting that the numbers for the year 2015 are worse. Therefore, I have two question marks. Will the international community accept 
o el impionitis por narcotráficos en Colombia? And second, with this impunity, will the international communities, the United States, continue helping Colombia? Hi, Senor Uribe. Nice to see you again. Um, uh, my family has been a very big supporter of your administration and your party. Uh, but in preparation for your talk today, um, I did some of my own research, and some of the things that were most uh, uh, enlightening was basically a lot of the allegations against your administration, uh, specifically when you're in power. And I was hoping you could potentially respond to some of them, uh, which related to the paramilitary allegations, as well as the human rights uh, abuses, uh, with ones that have had verdicts, specifically like the parapolitics scandal, in which around 136 lawmakers in your party uh, were convicted of having paramil paramilitary financing, as well as your brother, Mario Uribe, who was the uh, president of the Congressional Congress. My cousin. Uh, your cousin, correct, I'm sorry. Uh, Mario Uribe, who's your, your cousin. Uh, and He's the same. He's the same. <laughs> right. But then, and then there was the allegation of one of your brothers actually like starting a paramilitary band. Um, and then there was also the allegations and the conviction of the director of DAS, um, in which he was convicted of murder. Uh, and providing intelligence information to paramilitary organizations. And so I was hoping you could respond to these uh, allegations and maybe clear some of the air, especially for some supporters and maybe people who are finding about some of these controversial issues on your background. Okay. I will try to separate all the issues. I don't know how to be short enough to answer these many questions involved in one. Members of Congress, who were taken to jail. The bad majority for accusations of collusion with paramilitaries before my administration. Second, I was elected without a strong congressional support. To say something clear to you, I was elected as independent candidate. Once elected, I created a coalition to pass, to approve my bills of law. And later on, some members of this coalition of, and members of the opposition were taken to jail because of allegations of involvement with the paramilitary organization before my government. It is very important to make it clear here or wherever I have to speak. My cousin, Mario Uribe, he was one of the people of Congress taken to jail. But he has said to me, is that he visit the paramilitaries when they were recruited in some confined, in some specific area for the peace process. Third, my brother. The, the sin of my brother is being my brother. He has suffered for more than 20 years. He has been a farmer. I, I wanted you to have the opportunity to meet him. And the only thing he has is that he's my brother. One, uh, I have been accused of being paramilitary. Why? My government was the only one confronting and dismantling and defeating the paramilitary organization. 4,000 were taken to jail, roughly speaking. And 14 kingpins were extradited to the United States. Human rights abuses. Human rights is the chair of leftist people in Latin America. 
Yesterday, I, it was an illuminating day for me here in this university. Because I had the opportunity to talk to, 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 to distinguished scholars. And they are working to protect the opposition in Venezuela. And they are very pessimistic because of the lack of government's support to the protection of the opposition in Venezuela. Because governments are very swift, diligent, to give protection to left people and to accuse those people that the left consider their adversaries. In Latin America and in my country, Human rights is a privilege, exclusive privilege of leftist people. Let me say this. My government was inaugurated in the year 2002. And a year after, my government, when our policies were succeeding, My government was accused by leftist organizations very close to guerrillas that we were killing innocent people. I made this decision. I said, when our armed forces shoot someone down in combat, please do not touch the body. You have to wait for the prosecutors to come. The army was angry at me. They said, why are you going to deprive us from our jurisdiction? In the year 2006, we signed an agreement with the general prosecutor for them to know every case of combat. But they have abuse. They have incurred in excesses. In every case of someone shutting down, the prosecutor has said that it has to be investigated as a crime. We cannot attend this, accept this. In the year 2000, 2008, I was said at night that there could be some people in the army responsible for human rights abuses. That meeting ended at midnight. The morning, at morning, very early at seven, I communicated to the country my decision to fire 27 top military officials. In every case, we knew human rights abuses. We proceeded, but I have supported the armed forces. There have been many cases of false accusations. For instance, they say that the armed forces kill 4,000 innocent people. And my reply is, uh, how can the country reach security during my years if we did not shoot down guerrillas and instead we kill innocent people? I cannot understand this. For I am fighting all over the country and all over the world, my friend. And I consider this. My government never hid some wrongdoing. My government was always in disclosure. One of my rules in government is 
government should be a reality. People should know on time what happens in their government. <laughs> Therefore, every case in Colombia was open to the public scrutiny. And then let me add this. I cannot understand why 60 years of politicians submitted to guerrillas in many areas of the country. There has been only one single sentence. Why the judiciary were after politicians involved with paramilitaries. The judiciary has been totally indulgent with politicians involved with narco guerrillas. And I have said that the main guilt is the lack of security by the state, because in many regions of the country, politicians have had no option than to, than to submit to terrorist groups. But I ask the judiciary, in some cases, the judiciary has imposed fair sentences against politicians, in many cases unfair sentences. Leave it aside. My question is why the judiciary has not investigated, has not sentenced that collusion between politics and narco guerrillas. And if you look at the news of the last week, consider this. Now FARC is traveling around the country, guns at their shoulders, and they say that they are doing pedagogy for the peace talks. They are in politics with guns. We cannot accept this combination of all forms of doing politics. This is a, a rule of the old Marxist doctrine. It was very damaging in Colombia. Many people of the left political parties were killed. And one of the reasons was their involvement, the combination of politics and violence. And we are seeing the country again, this ugly combination. We cannot accept this, my friend. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here, President Uribe. Um, I'm from Mexico, and in Mexico we've had the problem of the government uh, not, uh, um, well, some people will argue we still have the problem of the government uh, not respecting the results of elections. Um, and recently in Latin America we've seen in Bolivia, in Argentina, even in Venezuela, with some exceptions, that uh, the democr uh, democracy seems to be working and that the government uh, it looks like the governments are actually respecting the results of elections. Is this a sign of progress in Latin America? Or should we take uh, this uh, not as a celebration, but we uh, should still look out for violations of democracy? Of course, it has been good news for democracy. The outcomes in Venezuela in Argentina and the recent referendum in Bolivia. In February, in the coming February, Ecuador will hold presidential elections. But look at this. In Venezuela and in Argentina, people could defeat the governments because of the people's domestic effort. 
I want to compliment the people of Venezuela and the people of Argentina. Without international cooperation, they defeated electoral frauds and electoral dictators. It has been good news for the region. One of my reasons giving tranquility to my country, calm to my country, is that I have supported the opposition of Venezuela at any moment. The example of Venezuela, the example of Argentina, the recent example of Bolivia, are good examples that the only way to clean up democracy, to have transparent elections, and to recognize outcomes is by the effort, domestic effort, of the citizens of the respective country. Tim, if you don't matter, I will try to gather the Renman questions. Okay. Yep. Uh, and to give one only answer. Um, so, seeing the recent developments in countries neighboring Colombia that undoubtedly... Excuse me, slow sorry, please, slower, please, lower, please. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, seeing... Well, when I was young, <laughs> I couldn't see TV in English. Okay. Si quieres el otro ojo, el español se le hace más No, él en inglés, pero espaciecito. Ah, okay. <laughs> Por el respeto a todo el público. <laughs> So, um, seeing the recent developments in countries that neighbor Colombia that undoubtedly have a severe effect on the country, um, I just want to hear what your opinions were on the stance Colombia should take in international diplomacy affairs. And to this, I point specifically to its neighbor to the east, Venezuela, um, whose capital, Caracas, was recently named the most dangerous city in the world. So, what actions has, is, and should Colombia take to protect its own people and borders while still serving as a safe haven for Venezuelan refugees? who are fleeing the instability arguably set forth by President Maduro. You are speaking as fast. Oh my goodness, as quick I'm so sorry. As you read, but I, I have understood. Okay, so sorry about that, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for my memory. Colombian reaction to the case of Venezuela. Okay, second. Who is going to be the second dean? Uh, thank you for being here, President Uribe. Just like you, I'm Colombian. Um, I wanted to ask you about the restructuring of Plan Colombia and its renaming to Peace Colombia. You've expressed your opposition to this shift in policy. Um, why is that, and what do you think is a better use of the funds provided by the United States government? Plan Colombia, the old and the new versions. Venezuela, Colombia, Plan Colombia. Yeah. During your administration, Colombia had significant prosperity and security increase. What, and due to your, partly to your mode of administration, what do you think is the motivation of the current president, Juan Manuel Santos, to not continue with your mode of administration? <laughs> <laughs> I will keep in my, mo in my memory the question I didn't want. <laughs> but I will try to, to give you some, some hint. <laughs> Dean, please. President Uribe, I'm from Medellin, Colombia, ah, and I went to university I, too. <laughs> I, I hear your accent. I know. <laughs> it I is, say, it, it is not difficult for me to understand your accent. Great. <laughs> there, there is a close friend of my wife. 
<laughs> when she listened to me in English, she says, I don't know English, but when Alvaro speaks, speaks English, I do not need translator because <laughs> he speaks so paisa that I can understand him without translation. Very proud. Uh, it's an honor and I'm very supportive of Euro. And my question, one of the questions, I think you already answered a little bit about the corruption. You say about the guerrilla, about the narcotraffic, and about the paramilitares. But I think, probably in my opinion, I will include the corruption. But because when you took the president, the corruption was terrible in Colombia. So I know that you did a lot of things for that. And my other question is, how do you see the near future in Colombia? Is there any political party that you think that can follow your steps and come back to bring the country up because it must be frustrating for you. All do you did, I know that you was a hard worker. My family is a great supporter and see that the things is going back. So I don't know, did you, do you see any political party that we can have a future with them? Remember, this is not a propaganda auditorium. <laughs> <laughs> I am a politician. Okay. I cannot lose the the, the opportunity. But, I mean, no, you don't have to mention names, but you see it's a future in Colombia and future. Yes. Corruption, Colombian future, political party for the future, <laughs> Venezuela, reaction, plan Colombia. Juan Manuel Santos. Ah. <laughs> Excuse me, Dean. The lady wants. Uh, so don't answer this for, and then we'll bring the other two back. Okay. I cannot understand the passivity of my government regarding the problems in Venezuela. In the international legislation, there are principles, the principle of no intervention and the democratic chart of the Americas brings the principle of full respect to democracy. In accordance with uh, the democratic chart, every signatory country has the obligation to respect democracy domestically and to denounce violations to the rule of law in other countries, signatories of the chart of the Americas. For I cannot understand the passivity, passivity, the silence of our government regarding the case of Venezuela. In Colombia, the omission of president of the current president to denounce this could be explained by his idea that the only way for him to sign an agreement with FARC is through the mediation of Maduro, the dictator of Venezuela. I do not see a different explanation to give you my answer. Of course, I have been in total disagreement. The only media I have is my Twitter account. And every day I denounce the dictator of Venezuela. Of course, you have brought an additional problem. The continuity of the presence of narco-terrorists, Colombian narco-terrorists, in the territory of Venezuela, very close to the borderline. Last week, from Cuba to Colombia, were um, carrying some keen things of heart, of park. And many terrorists came from Venezuela to the Colombian territory and they did politics with guns and with terrorist uniforms. This is no news. In the bordering regions, 
Colombian terrorists who are protected in Venezuela quite often, part of borderline, come to Colombia and start our people and go back to Venezuela where they have the paradise, the campgrounds. The government in Colombia does not say anything. I disagree. Reaction. Plan Colombia. I will try to, to, to work with my memory. <laughs> because I am getting older. I am this year on July the 4th. I will be 64. And I have to, to, to challenge my memory. I disagree with the Colombian government. No more spraying, manual eradication at the lowest. The outcome is the increase in narco trafficking. There are regions of the country where the country has been unable to explore oil wells because the regions are dominated by FARC. There are more extortion in the country, territorial control. People don't dare to, do not dare to denounce because they are not certain that they are going to have governmental protection. They prefer to pay extortion than to run the, run the risk. Narco trafficking is considered a political crime for FARC to get amnesty. I disagree with all these aspects. I agree with Plan Colombia, whatever the agreement with the United States, but with the correction of these faults. With these faults, we cannot agree. Third, corruption and the future. Yesterday I had a many, and today I have had many important meetings here with professors, with the scholars, and with the students. And yesterday one professor at the end invited me to record a video today. And we did it, we did it this afternoon. And I was asked the same question. I believe in people participation. The rule of law needs independent institutions, needs penal courts, criminal courts, administrative punishment, imprisonment, fines. All these means of control are needed by the rule of law. But in my opinion, the most important is people participation. My government had one very, we made many decisions. For instance, when we were going to assign a contract in a public bid, all the discussion between among all the bidders was in public audience. For instance, when we assigned the concession for the new airport in Bogota, we had almost one month of discussion publicly on live TV. It, was, it has been very important. And in my weekly meetings with communities in Colombia, we dedicated one section to which I call visible contractors. We call the contractors to come and to respond to the people complaints. Before that, people did complain for the roads, 
for the public work, but people have not the possibility to see the face of contractors. When we began to call contractors, for them to come to these events, they began to be much more on time to fulfill their obligations. Our peop and people began to be much more confident in transparency. When my government denounced and accepted on time our wrongdoings before the criticism of the opposition, we did well. And we failed. When confronting wrongdoings in my government, instead of recognizing and accepting these problems and making the decision to correct these problems, we began to argue and to disclaim these problems. One of, me, of my advice to young leaders is, it is better that you by yourself or by your team accept on time your own doings than to wait for the opposition to denounce. We had the two experiences, the good and the bad. What is the other question? What is the, the, the political future? Last week, I was said, what, the, what is the future of your political party? Santor will sign with FARC, and you disagree. Santor will build a plebiscite. It's not hard. It is very easy. In the year 1957, Colombia had a plebiscite to adopt the National Front. It was a country of 14 million people. And this plebiscite had 4 million, over 4 million yes votes. Santos, in clear defiance to the Constitution, Colombian Constitution, Har has lowered the threshold from 50% to 13. I do not see a different explanation to give you my answer. Of course, I have been in total disagreement. The only media I have is my Twitter account. <laughs> and every day I denounce the dictator of Venezuela. Of course, you have brought an additional problem. The continuity of the presence of narco-terrorists, Colombian narco-terrorists, in the territory of Venezuela, very close to the borderline. Last week, from Cuba to Colombia, were um, carrying some keen pins of heart, of park. And many terrorists came from Venezuela to the Colombian territory, and they did politics with guns and with terrorist uniforms. This is no news. In the bordering regions, Colombian terrorists who are protected in Venezuela, quite often part of the borderline, come to Colombia and start our people and go back to Venezuela where they have the paradise, the campground. The government in Colombia does not say anything. I disagree. Reaction. Plan Colombia. I will try to, to, to work with my memory. <laughs> because I am getting older, I am this year on July the 4th, I will be 64. 
and I have to, to, to challenge my memory. I disagree with the Colombian government. No more spraying, manual eradication at the lowest. The outcome is the increase in narco trafficking. There are regions of the country where the country has been unable to explore oil wells because the regions are dominated by FARC. There are more extortion in the country, territorial control. People don't dare to, do not dare to denounce because they are not certain that they are going to have governmental protection. They prefer to pay extortion than to run the, run the risk. Narco-trafficking is considered a political crime for far to get amnesty. I disagree with all these aspects. I agree with Plan Colombia, whatever the agreement with the United States, but with the correction of these faults. With these faults, we cannot agree. Third, corruption and the future. Yesterday I had uh, many, and today I have had many important meetings here with professors, with the scholars, and with the students. And yesterday one professor at the end invited me to record a video today. And we did it, we did it this afternoon. And I was asked the same question. I believe in people participation. The rule of law needs independent institutions, needs penal courts, criminal courts, administrative punishment, imprisonment, fines, all these means of control are needed by the rule of law. But in my opinion, the most important is people participation. My government had one very, we made many decisions, for instance, when we were going to assign a contract in a public bid, all the discussion between among all the bidders was in public audience. For instance, when we assigned the concession for the new airport in Bogota, we had almost one month of discussion publicly on live TV. It, was, it has been very important. And in my weekly meetings with communities in Colombia, we dedicated one section to which I call visible contractors. We call the contractors to come and to respond to the people complaints. Before that, people did complain for the roads, for the public works, but people had not the possibility to see the face of contractors. When we began to call contractors, for them to come to these events, they began to be much more on time to fulfill their obligations. And people began to be much more confident in transparency. When my government denounced and accepted on time our wrongdoings, before the criticism of the opposition, we did well. And we failed when 
confronting wrongdoings in my government instead of recognizing and accepting these problems and making the decision to correct these problems, we began to argue and to disclaim these problems. One of my, of my advice to young leaders is, it is better that you by yourself or by your team accept on time your wrongdoings than to wait for the opposition to denounce. We had the two experiences, the good and the bad. What is the other question? What is the, the, the political future? Last week, I was said, what, what is the future of your political party? Santor will sign with FARC, and you disagree. Santor will build a plebiscite. It's not hard. It's very easy. In the year 1957, Colombia had a plebiscite to adopt the National Front. It was a country of 14 million people. And this plebiscite had 4 million, over 4 million yes votes. Santos, in clear defiance to the Constitution, Colombian Constitution, have, has lowered the threshold from 50% to 13. We need only 4.4 million votes to approve the plebiscite in a country with 48 million people. <coughs> and he had the majority in Congress. Congress is giving Santo the same type of limitless powers for him to introduce by decree the subjects agree with FARC that should be subject of ordinary laws. In accordance with this power, the current president will issue decrees and what need the law. And far would say, okay, yes, everything is fine, but we need stability. Remember, many Latin American countries in the past enacted full stop laws. And with few exceptions, with, with the cause of exception is Uruguay. These uh, laws have been dropped. Last week, some people in El Salvador were arrested, lame of human rights violations during the war. In contrast with the peace agreements, for agreements with impunity are not stable. In fact, to assure its impunity, we'll ask for a constitutional assembly for their impunity to be stable. And they will say, constitutional assembly to ratify the agreements and to complement them, we say, Constitutional Assembly to review the agreements, to approve or to disapprove, to add or to modify. This is a huge difference. Consider this, the worst scenario for our party. We lose, the government wins the plebiscite, signs with FARC, Issue, issue the decrees to introduce subjects of ordinary legislation, and after it comes, 
the Constitutional Assembly. We think our party should be a reserve to fight for the well-being of private initiative in my country of the rule of law, whatever the political outcomes in the near future. We have to be strong fighters for our conviction, convictions, whether or not we will, we win. The last one, I didn't understand. No, I, I remember the, the sir who asked me about why Santos changed. The other, yeah, the other gentleman. Yes, also. I cannot understand. Uh, At the Stanford University, there is a study differentiating between betrayal and deceit. Engaño is deceit, David. I don't say, I don't speak about betrayal, because betrayal is a much more personal. I speak about deceit to nine million votes. I don't know. Many people speak on the Nobel Peace Prize. I don't know about that. But whatever the course of the country, we will continue fighting. Last question. Buenas noches, señor expresidente de Colombia. I'm from Colombia. Uh, I admire you from all your convictions and the love of patriotism you have for Colombia, because I know your motto is all about patria. You believe in patria. Talking about the future and talking about this betray and this misunderstanding and this all mess we have in Colombia is all about anarchy, is all about impunity. Let's don't talk about parties. Let's talk about people. What is the way? What is the hope? You people adore you or people hate you? <laughs> what is, yes, with you is not in the middle. <laughs> ¿Qué dijo yo, you can? ¿Qué dijo ella, middle point? Middle, uh, no, very, no, estamos en la mitad. O te odian o te aman. <laughs> eh, señores Presidente, you are the only strong voice in the middle of the impunity and the anarchy than we are living in Colombia. What is the way and what is the hope to, re, to restore and to rescue institutions and to put again the law, the law, the law, the law of, the, of the land and the law of the men? That is for the future, talking about the past. The same question, what went wrong with Santos. He was mean defensa. He was the minister of defense of your country, of our country. What happened? He was one of the five ministers of defense. I was born in the Colombian rural areas where we trust each other. And I trusted Santos. And you, you know what? Has happened. I want to say to you this. I am confident in the Colombian people. Because Colombia has a very strong tradition of the rule of law, Colombian people are hardworking people with a very strong 
entrepreneurial spirit. Therefore, Colombian people is the last, is the defense of last resort for our rule of law. Therefore, I will try for my part, party for all of us to do our best to correct our mistakes. And while we are with forces, to continue fighting for the country. Be confident in our people. I want to express my, my gratitude to all of you, to the university, to the USA democracy. No? Muchas gracias a todos.